Hello, I'm Dr. Martin Rosen with my wife here, Dr. Nancy Watson, and today we'll be mapping fascial distortion patterns on the 15-minute matrix. Welcome to the 15-Minute Matrix. I'm Andrea Nakayama, functional medicine nutritionist and your host. This is the podcast that brings you bite-sized insights and lessons on the clinical relevance of the functional nutrition matrix, the most important tool in functional medicine and functional nutrition. The matrix is so important not only because it invites us to stop and assess, but also because it reminds us of three very important factors in our care, our recommendations, and our outcomes. Everything is connected. We are all unique and all things matter. Be sure to head over to this episode's show notes at 15minutematrix.com if you'd like to see today's topic mapped on a downloadable matrix to remind you of these critical aspects of care. Today on the 15 Minute Matrix, I'll be speaking with Dr. Martin Rosen and Dr. Nancy Watson. Doctors Rosen and Watson are 1981 summa cum laude graduates of Life Chiropractic College. Since 1982, they have maintained a private practice in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Besides their practice, they've traveled nationally and internationally, teaching chiropractic technique, pediatrics, cranial adjusting, chiropractic philosophy, and practice management. Together, they also run the Peak Potential Institute, offering premier educational programs for healthcare professionals. Their most recent book, It's All in the Head, was written to inform and bring awareness of the implications of growth and developmental challenges in the early stages of childhood development. The book strives to assist parents in answering the questions, is my child's development normal? Their book empowers parents with the ability to understand normal developmental milestones and to recognize problems in the earliest stages, allowing them to seek appropriate care before problems become entrenched and create diagnosable dis-ease processes. They are dedicated to giving chiropractors, healthcare providers, and parents a new perspective when it comes to children's health. Through their combined 80 years of teaching, writing, and clinical experience, they've brought a unique insight, motivation, and support to thousands of individuals on numerous fields. Hello, Dr. Marty and Dr. Nancy. Welcome to the 15-Minute Matrix. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for it's having great us. being here again. Yes, fun to have both of you here. I always love these conversations that take me well out of my comfort zone of understanding. And Dr. Rosen, you certainly do that in the most fascinating ways. I'm wondering if you could kick us off or if you could both kick us off by talking about what fascial distortion patterns are. Sure. So if you think of your body as different layers of sheaths, the fascia is a sheath that covers over the muscles, attaches to the nerves, attaches to the bone. So it's like this entire sheath that covers the body that maintains tension, maintains function, helps with neurological input, helps with what we call the duramenindial system, and helps with muscle movement. So it's a sheath that has a certain amount of tension that is supposed to be represented throughout the body. If there's too little or too much, it can create not only distortion patterns, but neurological deficits and functional and biomechanical deficits. So how does that relate to pain and pain reception? Well, anything that happens in your body by the third trimester of pregnancy, you already have learned as a fetus to distinguish pain and pleasure. So any input that you get into your body, whether it be an external or an internal input, your body delineates it as either a pain or pleasure sensation. And obviously our goal in life usually is to avoid the pain and to find things that cause pleasure. So anything that happens to the fascial system that it feels as an insult or a positive it processes it through the brain in that way and creates reactive compensatory patterns based on if they're good or bad input to the brain and how it functions and how it sees those inputs. Yeah, it's really fascinating when we think about chronic pain and its connection to fascia, but I'm wondering if you could speak into more about how this relates to the fascial distortion patterns. I understand the fascia and I'm still working my way towards those distortion patterns. So two things. Tension in the system 
through the fascia and the dural meningeal system controls also the nervous system. So too much or too little tension. Think of your body as a tuned instrument. And if you have a guitar string, right, and you have a tuning fork at the end and you turn that tuning fork too loose or too tight, you change the tone of the string and you get it basically off key. Well, in your body, there is fascial and dural systems attached to the cranium and attached all the way down to the tailbone. And then they attach to all the vertebral bodies and all the nerves as it comes down the spine. And all those implement the amount of tension that that system has. So if you create too much tension, for example, a baby or a person who's always tense, really tight, really what we call sympathetic dominant, has a hypersensitivity because the system's too high tuned. It's like if you tune your guitar string too tight and you start to play it, it snaps. Well, the nervous system kind of does that. Matter of fact, they say that one of the most traumatic and damaging things to a nerve is to cause too much tension in it. So a system that's heightened in tension doesn't have the same threshold as a system that has a normal tension. It tends to break down faster. It tends to be insulted more by pain. It tends to react to hypersensitivity more. So again, it loses its threshold to deal with stress and adapt. One of the things that kind of spurred Dr. Marty and I to really explore this was when we were visiting Texas in 2019 and we went into a toy store and we saw babies, dolls that were very distorted, distorted faces. They were stuck in what we call flexion. And I looked and I thought, wow, this is how babies are coming into the world in this sympathetic state. And so, uh, so what we see in our practice and what we kind of focus on in us is this dural stress that's happening from the moment that we're born, possibly even before we're born. So that's one of the things that we notice is that babies are being born into a sympathetic state. They're carrying that through. They have developmental milestones when their nervous system is developing. So we're really focusing on trying to correct these problems to be able to call attention to them. Many of the new mothers that are coming in are noticing this. Their babies are inconsolable. They don't sleep. They can't eat. So that's one of the things that we're noticing a lot more of. Maybe it's always been there, but what we notice is that once the, like say, the industry of the toy industry starts making babies that are distorted, it tells me that what is not normal is becoming, because it's common, it's becoming normal. Like and we're normalizing these distortion patterns. So and that's all in the fascia, and that's in the first, you know, two years of life. So that's what we're noticing, and what we're really focusing on in our practice is trying to help these young mothers and these young babies have a better start to unwind their nervous system, to unwind their fascia. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions now. What does that look like to you when you walked into that toy store? What does that even look like? I took pictures of all of those dolls. She I did. was actually so upset because having had children, I know it's not normal to be like stuck in these distorted passions or faces that are distorted. So yeah, we, I actually took pictures of all of them and said to myself, I can't let people think this is normal. It's common, but it's not normal. If, you know, if you, you take the Barbie doll image that, you know, in our generation, people grow up with the Barbie doll thinking that's what, you know, women or men, if you want to take the Ken doll, is supposed to look like. I think that was part of the issue that created a lot of this body dysmorphia. As kids got older, they were like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to look like. I don't look like that. And so now what Nancy said is we see these babies because people who are producing these things are basically taking a general view of the population and modifying it to fit some particular marketing paradigm. And now what we're doing is becoming more accepting of just what Nancy said, of things that are common as normal. For example, let's just take neurodevelopmental issues. We got out of school, people on the autism spectrum were one in 2,500. Now they're one in 42 and people are just going, oh, that's just the way it is. And now we just keep changing the names. You know, now we can't call them on the spectrum. Now they're neurodevelopmentally challenged. We keep giving them names, but according to Health and Human Services, 54% of our kids have chronic illnesses. And out of the 54% of a high percentage of that is neurodevelopmental issues. So what we see in our practices are kids who, they're constipated. They can't go to the bathroom, right? They have trouble nursing. They can't sleep at night. The parents are really stressed. They're inconsolable. Their whole system is tense. They're not reaching their milestones. You know, they can't do tummy time. They cry in tummy time. They can't roll over at the right time. I mean, it's just a whole plethora of things that we're seeing. And we've been in practice 40 years. So I don't think it's always been there because we've always been in pediatric practice. It's much more prevalent. So it's not the focus exclusively pediatrics. It's one of the things that we know that we can have the greatest effect on because we know that we can unwind the nervous system of a baby much easier than we can unwind the nervous system of a 50-year-old. Right. So back to the whole fascia thing, it shows up. It shows up as distortions, as distortions in the cranium, whether it be what people call flat spots. The American Pediatric Association says 47% of kids 
now are born with cranial distortion. So that's what they recognize. 47% of kids born with some kind of cranial distortion patterns. And a lot of it has to do with lifestyle things, you know, putting kids in carriers and car seats, forcing them to sleep on their back. All that creates molding in the cranium. And once the cranium distorts, because the fascia attaches and the dura attaches to that, it then distorts the fascia. And then again, that reflexes into the muscular system, skeletal system, and neurological system. Our systems in our body are not independent. They're interrelated. It's like hit your toe, right? When you stub your toe, how long does it take for you to know that, you know? And so these are all trained. And in the kids, the other thing we see is reflexes, you know, primal reflexes are all designed to protect you as a child so that you can respond to the environment and at a reflex level right. and survive. But there's a certain point where they're supposed to stop. And what happens a lot with these kids who are in these survival modes or what we call sympathetic dominant is the primal reflexes remain. And so they react in the rest of their life in a fight or flight state because they never got rid of those primal reflexes. Right. And we know that's going to impact the immune system and the whole nervous system and the hormones. And it's just a cascade from there. Exactly. And so for me, I know like when I was a new mom, it was really important for me to know what was expected or what was going to be the norm because the body does respond. The babies do grow up and have developmental milestones and they're supposed to hit them within certain periods of time. So for me, I I was driven when I saw these distorted dolls. I was like, okay, I need to let people know that this is not normal, that children should not look like this and there's something they can do about it. So that was a driving force for Marty and I to uh, put together a book last year and to kind of give parents a guideline of like, this is where you should be in. Like, this is kind of the place that you're looking for. Your babies want to hit these milestones within this period of time. The cranium should look like this. Parents want to know that. I also think parents are always striving in most cases to get their kids' potential optimized. Like no one wants to settle with your kid. It's like, right. oh, I think, you know, it's okay. It's okay. If, you know, <laughs> Mediocre's you okay. Well. I mean, it's okay. You know, I, mean, I mean, we live in the Metro West area outside of Boston. So it's a very competitive area, you know, where, very educated. you know, 20 minutes from Harvard, you know, 20 minutes from MIT, Wellesley County. I mean, it's just like a plethora of, you know, brainiacs here. So no one goes to the kid. Oh, it's okay if he can't add at 15. And I'm just talking about nervous system development. People don't want to settle. And what's happening, I think, you know, the CDC just came out with reduced guidelines. And what we're seeing in the global world is people are trying, uh, becoming more accepting of decreased function. And that's not okay with us. And that was never okay when we raised our kids. You know, if you talk to our kids, they might think we may have pushed a little harder than we should have at certain points. But our our goal was always the same, to optimize your potential so that you're on your own, you can function as best you possibly can. And I was saying that to a son of a friend. I said, you know, we watched the Olympics. I, I was always into sports. I love the Olympics. I said, if we were watching Olympics every year and we started to see people running slower, swimming slower, not jumping as high, like, would it be okay? If, oh, the new world record is now you don't have to run a, you know, under 10 second, 100 yard dash. Now you can run a 12 one and a 12 second and be fine. We wouldn't accept that with our athletes. We wouldn't accept people watch. So why were we accepting our kids saying, oh, don't worry if they don't cross that milestone, you know, they'll catch up later. Or it's not a big deal if you know, the neurological development is, is being stunted. Or So I think that's, you know, the crux of why we did it. It was like, no, we can't keep accepting our generation's decreasing neurological function. Right. Because as you said, it, it ties into the immune system. We have, I mean, I'm sure in your world, you see kids with more immune system issues and more allergies. I mean, every kid has an allergy. I and mean, when I was growing up, I never thought peanuts could kill. Yeah. So what do you think, I want to talk about the milestones, but what do you think are the antecedent? What's happening in utero or do you know, or can you guess that's causing babies to be born with this fascial distortion? So uh, several things are happening in utero, I think. Number one, birth has become a medical procedure now. It's like it's not even considered a natural process. It's treated as a disease. I think that, you know, these constant ultrasounds over and over again checking, ultrasounds have an effect on the fetus. We know that. We've seen it. Ultrasounds have an effect. Constant ultrasounds, stresses in parents, you know, having to, you know, not being able to take care of themselves, poor dietary choices. There's a whole plethora of things, the amount of stress that's out there just in the world, all that affects the fetus as it grows. We know for years, like even just the music you play to a baby affects some of their neurological development. So you have a stressed parent, you have poor nutrition, you have environmental factors. You know, I I don't want to go into a whole lot of it, but people have talked about electromagnetic (laughs) fields. You know, in the 1930s, chiropractors were writing about electromagnetic fields causing cancer and damage. And now we're basically, you can't get away from it. You're surrounded by them. Like I said, you know, we live in Boston, outside of Boston. It's a very 
deeply seated medical area. And I've had patients come in on their firstborn and the doctor saying, if you don't go into labor one day after your due date, we're going to induce you. We see that all the time. Mm-hmm. And the amount of stress, like, oh, I have to be done on my due date. So well, I also that. think and they're not letting women be empowered by their pregnancy. I think that's a big piece of it. It's like it's a very powerful process to go through, carrying a baby and delivering a baby. And women have to be empowered by that. I mean, when you make it a medical condition and put all this fear into a woman that she doesn't have the ability to give birth naturally or the way that she chooses, I think it's very damaging. You know, right. yeah, and, I, and even rates like C-section rates are up to as high as 38%. In the, in the 60s and 70s, the C-section rate was 6%. So everybody thinks, oh, C-section is easy. We cut the mom open and take the baby out. It's like, no, it's, it's that's a, very, a horrific yeah, process, yeah. not only to the mom, but there's no contractions. The baby's head doesn't get the mold correctly. And then so much guilt around it all too, like depending on what choices you make. And it's interesting because there's this pendulum effect, right? Like we've certainly advanced in our medical technologies and some would say that's beneficial. And for some things in acute care, it is. But for what's healthy development, like through pregnancy, the invasion of the medical advancements is causing what you're saying are some of these developments that we're seeing. Right. I think medicine has advanced extremely in its emergency, intensive procedures, and intervention protocols, but it's not in its supportive protocols. Matter of fact, it's overridden them, and it's made it a sickness care system instead of a healthcare system, and we're just here to deal with the emergency, and, you know, we're going to create fear around it, and you have to have, you know, these certain parameters, and there's just not a lot of expansiveness in a lot of cases. I'm sure, I mean, that's not true everywhere, but as a generality, you know, it's become, like I said, everything's a procedure based on what if you don't do this right. and what if this it's happens. A, well, it's a fear-based system, and I do think that there's no other place to be in a state of emergency than be in the medical care, but pregnancy should not be a state of emergency, and I think that's the message that they give. Yeah, true. They don't give women the confidence that they can deliver, you know, so it's, it's hard. I mean, we have a lot of moms that don't buy into that, and they're right. choosing other things. I think one of the most appalling terms I heard, you know, in the last couple of years is geriatric pregnancy. Yes, oh. I'm like, oh my God, if you're 35, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm any, nowhere near 35 anymore. And so I'm in the, maybe if I got pregnant, I'd be in geriatric <laughs> pregnancy. But a 35 year old woman who's choosing to either wait a little bit in her life or whatever it is and gets pregnant at 35, she's not classified as a geriatric pregnancy, which puts her under a whole list yes. of things that you have to be careful of. I'm like, that's to me insane. We've had women that have, you know, have had babies in their mid forties. Yeah. Uh, we, we had one that came in as her late forties. Mm-hmm. So it can be a very empowering right. experience. And when you take that away from a woman, I do think that affects what we were talking about yeah. before the fetus, the neurological development, how babies are born. Are they being born into a state of fear? Are they being born into a state of emergency? I think that affects the, how their nervous system and, will then respond. And the birth process itself to go back to the distortion pattern. So part of the idea of the birth process is the baby starts in utero and then goes through the transition as it goes down the birth canal. And as it's going down the birth canal, the contractions and the pressure in the cra- on the cranium is increased tenfold. It goes from 10 millimeters of mercury in the uterus to 100 millimeters during transition. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that, and if you look at a baby's cranium, is for the cranium to compress and to basically what we call prime the pump of the primary respiratory mechanism. So that whole molding process and that whole compression force is basically priming the baby to come out of the uterus and to its first breath. When that process is interfered with, let's say even with Pitocin, when it becomes too intense or rush or the baby starts to crown and they put forceps on or vacuum delivery or anything where the doctor or the nurse or whoever's wanting gets in a distress state and then puts that distress state into the mother and then the process stops. That's a problem. There have been studies that show that the transition period that coming down the birth canal not only creates molding, but if that process is abnormal, it can create cranial distortions, spinal distortions, you know, especially the upper cervical spine. So that process is important to allow to unfold in the way it's supposed to unfold as well. So I want to talk about some of these milestones. We will link to the book in the show notes, but what are some of the key milestones that we should keep an eye out for? Okay. So the number one milestone, which I actually was talking to a doula the other day, which I thought was amazing. She said the first milestone is the baby's ability to turn head down inside the uterus. But then when they come out, the next milestone within the first month to maximum three months, they should be able to lift their head. Then the next milestone is for them to be able to turn over. And that again, somewhere in three to four months to roll from back to front and front to back. Then from that milestone, it should be sitting up. And that comes somewhere between around five to seven months. 
And then from the sitting up, the next milestone is either creeping like an army creep on your belly and then crawling on your hands and knees. And that again, somewhere in the first nine to 10 months, that should happen. And then we come to standing and then walking in a kind of a balanced mode, like with your hands at your side. And that usually around 11 to 13 months. And then by 17 months or 18 months, the baby should be able to walk and ambulate by themselves comfortably without holding hands, without being in balance mode. And what's important about these milestones is not only that they occur, but they're pre-programmed into our nervous system and they're programmed to fire off at specific times. So if that's not happening, that usually means there's some kind of problem or interference in the nervous system that's stopping those milestones from appearing at the right times. And so what the CDC just did like maybe like a month ago is actually change the milestones. And I think they changed the milestone in response to the children weren't hitting them. Now, whether that was because of the situation we've had in the last two years with the COVID and, and how things have changed, but they actually eliminated crawling as a milestone, which as is a necessary milestone. Which is, and they've also, they also changed when the speech is developed. I mean, they just changed it. They moved them out. And our concern about that is, that, first of all, they are pre-programmed. They are something that we go through naturally, but changing the milestones for the kids who are delayed, it's not a good idea to make that normal. We're going back to that whole idea of like make normalizing just because it's common. And children are being more challenged now. You know, they're delayed speaking. Everything is being delayed. So we need to look at why that's happening rather than normalizing it. And their rationale, their major rationale, if you read through all their literature, which is kind of what we talked about as a human potential, their rationale was that they were finding that only 50% of the kids were hitting the milestones that were already set and pre-programmed. And therefore they found that was a problem. So they lowered them. So now 75% of the kids are hitting the milestones. I'm like, that's like saying, oh, you go to school and 60 is a passing grade, but only, you know, 50% of the kids are passing. So now 50 is the passing grade. Yes. So now we get more kids that are reaching their milestones and everybody's hair quotes happy, but what we've done is lowered the bar. And the problem with that with parents, like say parents who whose children are challenged for whatever reason, they usually get service based on this. So if they normalize things, they won't be able to get their speech therapy or their OT. Or, so there's an economic factor to that that concerns us. And one of the other things, they, yeah, they reduce the amount of words that kids have to speak right. by age two. Well, yeah, if you've had kids mass for the last two years, you know, and they're learning to speak, of course it's going to reduce this ability to speak. So again, adapting abnormal right. consequences of the environment to making them normal is the kind of thing that really scares us the most. Exactly. There's such important points here. And I love how you're weaving together the work that we do, what's happening. And I love those conversations where we link back these cultural norms to health and healthcare. I'm wondering what we do about it. And I know you do the hands-on work, but in terms of access and what we can all do, I mean, what where my mind is going is support through pregnancy, right? Normalizing it, as you said, and working with the nervous system of the parents and the diet and the lifestyle and how we bring that back to a normal, not medical process and how that can make a difference right there. But what else can we do in addition to or in lieu of the hands-on work to make a difference here? As practitioners, I think our other job is to educate and to educate in an objective manner. So, I mean, Nancy and I, we have certain parameters and beliefs that we feel are true. And uh, we both agree that if the world listened to us, it would be a better place. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Um, but on the other hand, when I'm dealing with patients, my goal always is to kind of just feed information, almost like drip it in. Because you can't just sit there and, you know, pontificate at them. So I try and give them, like, if, if a mom can't nurse or chooses not to nurse and they're on a formula and they're using one of the over-the-counter formulas that are toxic, I'll say, look, here's a website that offers other formulas. This is what's in these formulas. And just look on the back of that formula, read it, and tell me if that sounds like food to you. You know, so to move them that way, you know, oh, my baby's not sleeping at night. You know, they're screaming in the other room. So, well, maybe it would be a good idea to maybe move the bassinet into your bedroom so that the baby would feel close. You know, so just give them little pieces of information or, you know, when it comes to as they're out of the utero and they're having developmental issues, talk to them about certain games they can play with their babies, how they mm -hmm. can facilitate crawling, how they can facilitate turning over. So it's they, about educating yeah. and empowering. The last, yeah, thing, that, the last thing. thing that we do is ever shame somebody for the decisions they made because we know that no parent or no person purposely hurts themselves 
or hurts their baby. Right. And so there's right. some distortion there to begin with. So for us, it's about educating and empowering them to take responsibility for their life, for their child, for what's going on. And we can't change what's already happened. We can only move forward with what, you know, what we can do. So it, there's suffering. We try to relieve the suffering. So, and we do that by empowering them because we yeah. don't, we don't want, we don't want to take responsibility for someone else's healing, but we want them to be responsible for their decisions. They so. really need to be able to make the choice. And that's exactly. what most helps. So even in our practice, when it comes to recommendations for care, it's about giving people honest information, right. allowing them to make the decision because that empowers them. They've made that decision. We'll facilitate, like when I'm done talking to a patient, I usually give them three options. You know, option one is you can leave the office now because you might not feel comfortable here. Option two would be to follow my recommendations to the fullest. Or option three will be fit into these recommendations, how it fits your lifestyle. And that's the same with all information I give people. It's like, this is what we've learned. This is what we've gleaned from years of experience. You know, try this. If your baby gets better, then accept it. You know, sometimes, you know, there was a great quote by um, Bruce Lipton, and I'll probably paraphrase it, but he said, you know, drugs are designed to allow people to continue with the same lifestyle they have and not make changes, but to continue that lifestyle. Mm, such a good point there. And I, I think you're talking to my favorite three E's, right? Empathy, education, and empowerment. Those are the E's we need in healthcare. Any final notes that you can share with our listeners about, you know, the importance of what you're talking about here? <laughs> yeah. So it's the first two years of life right. that you're laying down your child's foundation. 80 to 90% of the functional capacity and the tools, materials that they're going to have in their nervous system for the rest of life is actually formed and laid down in those first two years. So that's a really important time to actually listen to yourself. Moms, more so than dads, I hate to say, but moms have a, intu- they know when things are wrong. They know when people are lying to them. Trust your intuition. Try and push away the fear. Trust your intuition. If you see something, you know, it's kind of like we say in the airports now, if you see something, say something. If you see something that you're not clear with your baby, find someone who will listen to you. Mm -hmm. They don't have to agree with you, but at least support your foundation and help evaluate that so that you can feel clear and comfortable with what decisions you made. That's kind of what I think. I totally agree. I feel like it's growing in acceptance and and educating people. I mean, yeah, I totally agree with that. We have kids. We all have kids. And it's like we lay down the foundation. We feed into them, you know, our values, our morals, our ethics, all that. And then they take what they want and they mm-hmm. move with it. But the goal is to give your kids the greatest opportunity to be whoever they're going to be in their lives. And again, it's those first, even the first six years by age six, they have then developed a nervous system that they can live with for the rest of their lives, barring any major trauma. So that's your window of opportunity to make the input. You know, if you have teenagers, try and tell your 14-year-old what to do. <laughs> Beautiful. It's <laughs> a good, good point. <laughs> thank you both for sharing your wisdom with us today. And thank you, Andrew, for having us. Yes. It was great. We, we love what you do, and we really appreciate you allowing us to speak, too, at this point in time. The 15-Minute Matrix is hosted and produced by me, Andrea Nakayama, and the Functional Nutrition Alliance. The podcast is edited and mixed by Brian Paik of Pacific Audio, and special thanks to Natalie Merrill, Alia Hale, Pamela Geismar, and Rowan Bradley for their support in making the 15-Minute Matrix possible. You can find episodes on all kinds of topics with more incredible guests at our podcast website, 15minutematrix.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to see the completed functional nutrition matrix that accompanies today's or any episode, be sure to head over to the podcast website. Again, that's 15minutematrix.com. We love when you share our episodes with your friends and colleagues, leave a review and rate the show. That helps us to grow our collective message that functional nutrition is the future of healthcare. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Functional Nutrition Alliance, and you can follow me at Andrea Nakayama. And if you or someone you know is interested in becoming a functional nutrition counselor, head over to fxnutrition.com to learn more about our full body systems program. 
Full Body Systems is our 10-month immersion course where you'll learn the systems-based approach to addressing the root causes of your client's issues through client education, diet, and lifestyle modification. Again, you can always learn more at fxnutrition.com.